Good, good afternoon. Um, uh, I, I'm Mark Siegler, and I'm just delighted uh, to welcome you um, to the McLean Center's 40th annual uh, lecture series. Um, th th this is one that Dr. Mindy Schwartz uh, and I worked together uh, to organize. And um, uh, the title is Medical History and Ethics. And we're, we're so excited and delighted with our speaker today, uh, Dr. Robert Bob Richards. Uh, I just want to say a quick word that next week we'll have uh, the, the last talk of the fall quarter, uh, which will be given by uh, Lydia Dugdale from Columbia University in New York on the lost art of dying. Um, and then we'll be off for two weeks and we'll resume uh, at the beginning of uh, January, on January 5, um, with uh, a speaker uh, uh, who uh, you, you may not want to know from at the moment, but it's me <laughs> in January 5. Uh, but to, let, let me tell you about today's speaker, who is, is fantastic. Um, Robert Barb Richards, a PhD, is the Morris Fishbein Distinguished Service Professor in the History of Science and Professor in the Departments of Philosophy, History, Psychology, and in the Committee on Conceptual and Historical Studies of Science. Uh, Bob is also the director of the Morris Fishbein Center for the History of Science and Medicine. Uh, Bob received his um, degrees from the University of Chicago back in the 1970s. Um, uh, Professor Richards um, does research in history and philosophy of psychology and biology. And this includes a particular interest in evolutionary theory, biopsychology, ethology, and sociobiology. Um, he's written very many books. Um, uh, I'll just mention a few. Two books on the history and philosophy of evolutionary theory in Britain and America, uh, and also a book that describes and analyzes the impact of the German Romantic movement on philosophy and science in the age of Goethe. Um, uh, Professor Richard's teaching involves many of the aforementioned subjects, as well as more general courses on the history and philosophy of science in the ancient period, philosophy of history, and German intellectual history. Bob has won many, many awards and prizes that include the Gordon Lang Award, the Quantrell Award for Excellence in Undergraduate Teaching here at the university, the Pfizer Award, the George Sarton Medal from the History of Science Society, the Lang Prize in two, several times from the University of Chicago Press, and also a, he won the Simon Guggenheim Memorial Fellowship, as well as receiving the Sarton Medal for Lifetime Achievements from the History of Science Society. I could go on and on, but I'm looking forward- oh, Don't let me interrupt you, Mark, just go on and on. <laughs> I'm looking forward to hearing Bob's talk today, a talk that is jointly entitled, uh, The Metaphysics and Epistemology of History, or the Past is Not What You Think It Is. Um, uh, another version of that talk is the episiomology and metaphysics of histi historiography, my gosh. Um, but I, I'm leaving to Bob to tell us which, which of those titles will be standing. Bob Richards, please, it's all yours. Thanks, Mark. Well, I'm honored to participate in this lecture series and want to thank both Mark Siegler and Mindy Schwartz for the invitation to address you perhaps on an unexpected subject, namely not medicine, not even history of medicine, but on history as a discipline. Physicians since the time of Hippocrates have written patient histories. So I hope what I have to say about history more generally will be relevant to your concerns. As Mark suggested, I'm a historian of biology, particularly evolutionary biology, but I wanna reflect with you more generally about the nature of history. I was jarred from my dogmatic slumbers about history a few years ago by reading a passage from a book by a colleague at Stanford University, Paula Finland, 
Her book, Possessing Nature, is quite a good book on the history of natural history museums in early modern Italy. It opens with a vignette about Ulisse Aldrovande, who established a natural history museum in Bologna, Italy. I'll return to Finland and her account of Aldrovande in a moment. For the historian to give shape to past facts and provide an explanation for those facts, a host of assumptions has to be made. And for the reflective historian, those assumptions need to be justified. First, a very simple issue. What is meant by the past? The past is quite a funny thing. After all, the historian's principal subject doesn't exist. We may have present documents, but past events don't any longer exist. We can only try to reconstruct the past in our descriptions. But will it be the past as understood by the actors who resided in the past? Certainly it should be at least that, but which actors? Since all individuals will not have perceived events in the same way, were there millions of pasts but no unified past? And should we, we, we rely only on the actors' categories in our explanations of past events by focusing exclusively on the way actors of the past understood their world, the historian, I believe, will be precluded from actually understanding their world. Let me give you an example. Paula Finland, in her book, ascribed Ulysse Aldervandi's rise to fame as a naturalist to his account of a dragon that had been seen on the outskirts of Bologna in 1572. Here's the opening passage to her book. On May 13th, 1572, the very day that Hugo Bon Campani had, been chosen to, had chosen to return to his hometown to be invested as Pope Gregory XIII, a fearsome dragon appeared in the countryside near Bologna, an omen of terrible times to come. Soon word of its presence spread and a party was sent out to overtake it. The captured portent was duly carried inside the walls of the city for its citizens to inspect. Aldovati even had a portrait of the fearsome dragon done by one of his artists. In her fine book, Finland nowhere says, and oh, by the way, you know, dragons don't really exist. She merely details Aldovandi's work to establish his museum using the description of the dragon to establish his credentials. But wouldn't we like to know what he really saw because whatever he saw, it wasn't a dragon. At least he didn't see that thing he illustrated in his posthumous book, Serpentum et Draconum, on serpents and dragons. Shouldn't the account of the historian include things and events the actors themselves could not be aware of? Consider, if you will, the Black Death, the pestilence that the best historians of the period thought to be due to a miasma, but was really, of course, due to a bacillus, Yersinia pestis, carried by fleas, which were transported by rats. After all, don't we assume that fleas and the plague bacillus also existed in the, in the past and were explanatory factors in the actions of individuals, though those individuals are quite unaware of the real causes of the disease. As Marc Bloch, the great French historian observed, we're nevertheless successful in knowing far more of the past than the past itself thought good to tell us. Consider another dragon uh, that Aldovani depicts, an Ethiopian dragon. During the period that Aldovani was establishing his natural history museum, merchant ships were visiting distant lands and bringing back specimens from all over, from the Americas, from the Far East and Africa. I suspect the Ethiopian dragon was really the remains of a large fox bat from India, which can weigh up to 40 pounds. So I think we have to recognize the past exists in our descriptions, but descriptions while including the beliefs of actors should also include those events for which we had good evidence, but yet lie beyond the ken of the actors. Fox bats from India, for example. The second assumption the historian must make has to do with the kind of forces we think that can explain events. Are they causes or something else? One of my former colleagues at the university, the great historian of anthropology, George Stocking, said he never used the word cause when describing events. It's a word, though, that comes frequently to my lips. And if there are causes to explain events, what is their character? I think they need at least to be the sort that David Hume would have admitted, namely, they are antecedent events 
that may be linked to outcomes by our best scientific theories and historical experience. Such causes will generally be of two kinds, physical causes like the plague bacillus, or perhaps something like the remains of a large fox bat. The other kind of cause will be in the realm of cognition, in the minds of the actors, their beliefs, assumptions, psychological dispositions, the kinds of causes that lead to behavior of a certain sort. The astute historian will make the narrative of those antecedent causes as tight as possible, as tight as he or she possibly can, thus robbing the actor, I believe, of any free will in the situation. The historian may depict the actors as perceiving an open future, but the historian by his or her efforts of specifying antecedent causes closes off that future. From the historian's point of view, the explanatory effort will be deficient to the extent that in the narrative, the actor could have done otherwise. Let me mention an even more meta, meta consideration concerning explanatory factors. Does the historian have to appeal not only to the reader's intellect, but also to the reader's emotions? Consider two historians of the Romantic period, Friedrich von Schiller, the great poet historian and friend of the dramatist Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, and Wilhelm von Humboldt, also a friend of Goethe's and the intellectual architect of the University of Berlin. Both thought that the good historian would deliver descriptions that gave the reader something of the feeling of the emotional charge behind the proposed causes of events. This, I believe, is an aspect of historical explanation often neglected in intellectual history, but a crucial one for ramping up the explanatory narrative to another level. If there were an emotional component to the acceptance or rejection of a set of ideas by a past scientist, mustn't the historian contrive to make the reader feel a little bit of the same kind of emotion through the dexterity of his or her descriptions? Herein, I think, lies the art of the historian. A third assumption the historian must make, seemingly, I think, paradoxical, is that the past is changeable and unstable. This follows that the past only exists in the historian's constructions. The historian works with a concept of the past, as all individuals do, a concept that implies the fact the past is fixed. Whether this concept is comparable to a Kantian category or the result of experience, I'm not sure. But the concept of the past as fixed provides a framework, but one with changeable content. That just means that when a new construction of past events is established with better evidence, this becomes the new fixed past. But does this mean the past is like silly putty that can take any shape a persuasive historian can mold it into? Must there not lie beneath the constructions a foundation of reliable fact? Well, I believe there must but the foundation is assuredly is assured by the application of our best contemporary scientific understanding and historical experience. The history of Aldovandi's activities will have the scientific check of modern biological understanding, which precludes the existence of dragons, but certainly allows for the existence of fox bats. Sometimes our historical depiction will be laced with biographical, biographical accounts of the, his, the individuals involved. This is especially true in intellectual history or in my sub branch of intellectual history, the history of science. I'll consider a scientist whom I know something about, Charles Darwin. I'll use Darwin as an, as an example to illustrate a few other principles of historical analysis. Understanding Darwin's accomplishment immediately presents to the historian several significant problems. First, Darwin is almost a contemporary, contemporary figure or at least his shadow is. Many biologists and cultural critics refer indifferently to evolutionary theory and to Darwinian theory, so identified as the creator with the dominant theory in biology and in cultural discourse. This means, this means it's quite easy to read back into Darwin's accomplishment our contemporary understanding of evolutionary theory to make Darwin into a neo-Darwinian. Take two salient issues in assessing Darwin's accomplishment. First, whether he advanced a mechanist view of nature or an organicist view. And the second, whether he believed nature was evolutionarily progressive or not. Both issues are fundamental to understanding an historical account of Darwin's achievement. 
according to our contemporary conceptions of evolution, I think it's pretty clear evolutionary theory is both mechanistic in its portrayal of nature and non-progressivist. Nature through the course of millennia did not have us in mind, and was not striving to produce human beings. Now to make these issues a bit more vivid, I'll, I hope you'll forgive me if I refer to a book that has recently appeared called Debating Darwin, which I co-authored with Michael Roos, a prominent philosopher of science. We each wrote about a hundred pages laying out our understanding of Darwin's accomplishment and then commented on the other's interpretation in about 30 vitriolic pages. And then together we wrote a narrative bringing the story up to the present day. Discussing such issues as the status of human consciousness in modern theory and that of religion. Roos and I had exactly the same wealth of material by which to interpret Darwin's achievement, but we, come to we came to radically different understandings. I don't think Roos would object to my characterization of our dispute for Roos, Darwin is the extreme mechanist, turning nature into a steam engine, which chugs along without purpose or goal, or to change the metaphor, nature is a robot that takes a random walk. For me, Darwin is an organicist and holist who placed man as the goal of nature. Nature progressively advanced toward that goal, at least in Darwin's conception. Roos, like many social constructionists, began by examining Darwin's external socio-political environment. For Roos, the controlling environment of the Industrial Revolution in England. And then Roos moves more internally to determine how the environment <clears throat> made an impact on Darwin's mental life, presumably transforming the young man into a mechanist. I rather begin with that mental interior as revealed by letters, diaries, entries, and manuscripts, and then look toward the external environment to determine what captured Darwin's interest. My assumption is that the external environment was quite variegated and differed for different individuals, and that those individuals had to invest particular features of the external environment with meaning. The external environment did not simply shape the ideas of the scientist as a sculptor might chisel a piece of granite into a form. That I think is the wrong metaphor. Roos's Darwin comes out a mechanist who displaced man from a central position in nature and turned human morality into a puppet show of self-aggrandizement which is generally the neo-Darwinian view, and I think the more popular view of Darwin's achievement. My Darwin placed man as the purpose of nature and restrict and reconstructed that nature with a moral spine, yielding human beings as authentically moral creatures. Quite different perspectives, I think you'll probably agree, each dependent on how to make sense out of a scientist's personal life. Both of us marshaled the supporting text in Darwin's work, but those of you who do history of medicine to produce diagnoses from a set of factual symptoms, recognize there's no prescription for choosing the right text to illustrate a general thesis or focusing on the right symptoms to confirm a diagnosis. Such selections require the integrity and craft of the historian or the physician. Moreover, the good diagnostician, though he or she will listen carefully to patients' historical accounts of their symptoms, the good diagnostician will ask probing questions to undercover symptoms ignored by the patient or causes that did not enter into the overt historical account. Diagnosis is an art and even computer diagnostic systems usually have been built on a template furnished by a master diagnostician. The craft of such masters furnishes the columns written by Dr. Lisa, Lisa Sanders every Sunday in the New York Times Magazine. The lessons of the different diagnoses of Darwin's theory by Roos and me is that we both try to guard against the easy imposition of contemporary ideas. Roos affirms one set of ideas, I another, but each set of ideas is tied to the letters, diaries, and manuscripts. Well, maybe one of us does a slightly better job than the other in selecting the right data, but our work might be compared with that of the great biologist turned historian of biology, Ernst Meyer. Meyer composed a history of biology. His book was entitled The Growth of Biological Thought. It's a volume of almost 1,000 pages, two thirds of which are devoted to evolutionary theory. When he came to Herbert Spencer, that other founder of evolutionary science in the 19th century, a figure that Roos and I think extraordinarily important in the formation of evolutionary ideas, Meyer devoted but three paragraphs to the man because 
In Meyer's words, Spencer's positive contributions were nil. Meyer being the quintessential neo-Darwinian, I think imposing his own ideas on his hero, Charles Darwin. If Meyer had examined more carefully the biographies of those individuals whose contributions he believed to be significant, he would have found those individuals worked out their theories in relation to Spencer, an historical figure who simply can't be dismissed without, stored, without distorting the history of 19th century biology and a good deal of the history of social science in the early 20th century. Darwin's example brings to the fore the, another issue that bedevils many historians. Those who have tried to account for the accomplishments of any major figure of the past. The problem might be epitomized by two questions. What is Darwin's theory and where does it exist? We speak blithely of Darwin's theory as if it were an abstract entity of determinant meaning. If you examine Darwin's development of those ideas, it came to form the first edition of The Origin of Species. That is his conceptual work from just after he returned from the Beagle Voyage in 1836 to the publication of the first edition some 20 years later in 1859. You would find those ideas changing over time. A garden in which some plants blossomed and produced fruit and new seeds while others failed to thrive and died away. Moreover, if you consider the alterations wrought in the subsequent five editions of the origin, you would further track changes since the sixth edition is about 50% altered from the first. So I take Darwin's theory actually to be a historical entity which resides in the manuscripts, letters, and publications over his lifetime. In the mature state of Darwin's theory, say in the sixth edition, you can detect the confusions of its youth and the receding hairline of its final form. But each period is different and it would be a mistake to assume the phrase Darwin's theory has a univocal meaning. When you take a scrutinizing view of the life of Charles Darwin, you would not mistake his theory for an unchanging abstract entity. Nor would you be inclined to claim, say with Dan Dennett, that Darwin replaced divine intelligence, and this is quoting Dennett, with a completely stupid algorithmic process, natural selection. A close reconstruction of Darwin's accomplishments sh clearly shows that I think the divine intelligence hovered over the theories coming of age in the first edition. Had, Darwin, had Dennett's formulation been put to Darwin himself, he might've thought an algorithmic process was a new method of plant hybridization. A scrutinizing view of the life becomes an anchor that holds one steadily in the 19th century where Darwin resides and protect, protects against what might be called the great books fallacy or alternatively the well-wrought urn fallacy. That's the mistake of believing that one can fully grasp an author's intentions by regarding his or her great book as a well-wrought urn, something complete in itself with its intentions fully manifest. There's a sense in which Darwin began the process which continues to the present day of the disenchantment of nature, but the theory dwelling in the first edition still harbored, I believe, the divine mind. Now here's a problematic, as some in this audience will recognize, I think. A one, Charles Darwin wrote a book in 1859 read by many people as an atheistic tract. During the same year, another author by the same name wrote a book with the same title, but with the intention of showing how God's laws operated in nature and who professed to a friend, I had no intention of writing atheistically. Several critics I've already mentioned, Michael Roos or Dan Dennett, only account for one of these books. The astute intellectual historian will give a stereophonic rendering of both books not forgetting the one excavated from the intentional life of the great naturalist, but certainly also mentioning the book that contemporary biologists refer to in the first paragraphs of their textbooks on evolutionary theory. The great historian Thomas Babington Macaulay contended that history was both an art and a science. He wrote, the perfect historian is he, and it's always a he in the 19th century, in whose work the character and spirit of an age is ex exhibited in miniature. He relates no fact, he attributes no expression to his characters, which is not authenticated by sufficient, sufficient testimony. But by judicious selection, rejection, and arrangement, he gives truth to those attributions with, which have been usurped by fiction. Men will not merely be described, but will be made intimately known to us. 
The change in manners will be indicated not merely by a few general phrases or extracts from statistical documents, but by appropriate images present to it in every line. In other words, the artful historian will arrange his or her history to engage the reader's emotions, to make the reader feel the height of exhilaration or the depth of sorrow suffered by the actors in the history. This provides an understanding on a different level than the ethereal plane of reason. Perhaps it requires of the historian to engage in a bit of method acting, that is conjuring up from one's personal depths and experience something like that of the historical actor. In order to render the actor's actions explicable, in a small way, not so much to relive the life of the individual of the past, but to live one's own life as it might have been lived, which ultimately means that good history, like a good novel, is often autobiographical. Thank you very much. Now I'm ready for withering questions. Mindy, I think you're mute. You're muted. Okay, just what I need. Okay, let me just make you big here. Um, hold on one sec. <laughs> I feel like, do you ever have a feeling like you're like Dr. Demento? I mean, it's crazy. Okay, so let me go here. Okie dokie. Let me get rid of my, and my camera's gone? I mean, like, what is going on? Uh, hold on one sec. Is that better? Are we back? Yes. Great. Okay. Okay, so um, are we going to open it up for questions or should I start? Well, it's you're in command. Okay. I thought, th see, I think this is really interesting and provocative because I think that um, I love the idea that it's a dynamic interaction. And in some ways, what you said about history as being both an art and a science really resonated with me because I thought about the analogies to clinical medicine. And so, you know, this raises a bigger issue, like you say, is, is, is there one past, you know, and how do we think about this stuff? I also think on a practical level, I think there can be a case made for the benefits of history just in terms of helping people understand kind of human nature over time. You know what I mean? I think yeah. the really powerful thing is that the circumstances change, but people don't. And people are multidimensional, you know? I don't know. And I love this stuff about Darwin because I think it's really interesting. I didn't know that Darwin evolved as much as he did. That's fascinating. Well, Darwin was an individual who kept generating ideas. And in The Origin of Species, uh, the multiple uh, editions of The Origin, some six editions, he had he thought he had to account for the objections that would arise uh, from his theory. And so each of the editions after the first tries to answer some of the objections that had been posed to him. Uh, interestingly, Darwin leaves human beings out of the origin of species. He, does, he refers only at the very end saying, light will be thrown on man from his theory. But he doesn't discuss human beings at all. He took a strategic tact, namely, he thought if he talked about human evolution, that would occupy people's attention and uh, he would not get a fair hearing for his theory. So he left human beings out of the origin of species. Alas, the first reviews only focused on what the implications of his theory were for human beings. And his theory was often attacked because of that. So in 1872, he published The Descent of Man and Selection in Relation to Sex, which gave an account of human evolution. And the objections piled up multiply after that as well. But he's a man who kept changing his mind and he kept trying to answer his critics through the several editions of The Origin. 
See, but that's a good lesson for modern times is this constant, you know, change in that um, even good ideas get refined and changed over time. I think in some ways that's heartening for me, you know, just because I feel like we live in a time of incredible change and seeing other people's work in a more dynamic way, I think is very helpful. Well, I think Darwin provides a good model of that. We should all try to make our intellectual activities comparable to that of Darwin. Okay, but let's get to I something. I think you will su succeed in that though. <laughs> yeah, but here's another question speaking of that is, talk about the role of heroes. You know what I mean? How do we look how do we look at history as clinicians and not look with admiration to people who have been, I don't know if, I think we, we're living in an era where there's so many anti-heroes. In some ways, it'd be nice to find some people who you admire in history. You know what I mean? I do, but in the history discipline itself, hero worship is on the outs. Um, the great man theory of history is, presumably an indication of naivete on the part of the historian. Intellectual history too is, doesn't have much purchase in history today. Uh, I find that astounding, but because if you offer courses to undergraduates or graduate students and a history department, the intellectual history courses are oversubscribed and the social history courses well, they get a modest uh, review, but intellectual history is always of interest to students and to faculty as well, I think. But for whatever reason, the history departments across the country and the world have downplayed intellectual history and certainly do not think of heroes in, the history, in their intellectual history. Just to give you an example, um, James Secord, a great historian, who wrote a book on Robert Chambers, a man little known to anyone outside of a small circle of devotees, uh, produced an evolutionary theory prior to Darwin. It was published in 1844. But in uh, Secord's book on Chambers, he declares that more people were interested in, the general population were interested in his view of evolution and who the author was because it was published anonymously. And he decries the notion that Darwin should reap all the interest because he's a genius. And Secord thinks that that category of genius has seen its day. But if you read Darwin and you read Chambers, there's no doubt that Darwin was much more of an interesting intellectual than Robert Chambers could ever aspire to be. And it's just more fun and more interesting to read Darwin's work because he's not a, a one trick pony or a two trick pony. He's a pony that has many, many tricks. And reading the Descent of Man or the Origin of Species, you see those tricks on display. And they're really fascinating. But uh, you're right, I think people like Darwin do stand out. I work on Darwin because I think I find him an interesting intellectual. And he poses many problems that are still relevant today. And of course, evolutionary theory itself dominates biology and biological discourse and even contemporary discourse outside the academy. So I think your point is well taken, but not all historians take that point. Okay, so let me give you some of the things from the chat. Here's some questions people ask. Um, one of my Colleen, uh, colleagues, Arlene Chapman said, what are your thoughts regarding the potential role of intentional misinformation as it relates to the history of science? Should scientific uh, discovery, would it remain ultimately intact in the presence of this, all this misinformation? Well, there seems to be a flood of misinformation uh, go, coursing through the internet. I think you have to rely on people whose authority is gained by having published decent books on the topic of your interest, who have a decent reputation, and not simply pick up the kinds of information that's scattered along the internet without any evidence of the 
author's credentials. I'm sounding rather old fashioned, I suspect, but uh, that seems to me only one of the, the only reliable way of making sure that you're getting authentic information. Okay. There was a question I saw in the um, the chat in the chat about what about Darwin's incorrect views about races. Yeah, that was Elena's question. So yes, it says given some of Darwin's incorrect assumption about race and gender, how do you teach his intellectual theories while also recognizing and correcting these errors in his thought? without completely discrediting his work. So how do you avoid cancel culture or, you know, kind of all or none thinking? I think that's a great question is because just like you said, Bob, that's the reason you don't like heroes because people are multidimensional and over time, you know, you can't judge, you know, he could only know what he knew at the time, you know, he couldn't know what we know. Well, so, I think that's right, Mindy. I think that uh, someone like Charles Darwin is a, a son of the 19th century. He doesn't know what we know. He doesn't have the information that we have. He doesn't have the kinds of genetics that we have. So what Darwin must, I think, be forgiven for is he wasn't wise before his time. He took conventional ideas and found support for them. Races are like variations of a species. Darwin was not, uh, he's a complex figure. He was a, an abolitionist from the beginning. His whole family was an abolitionist family. And in his diaries, he gives poignant examples of the deleterious effects of racism in Brazil and in Central America. For instance, he tells the story of his traveling through the jungles of Central America and he reached a river and there was a bargeman who would take people across the river. It was a big African-American and Darwin in his wonderfully naive way was trying to make himself understood. He didn't speak Portuguese, but he was gesticulating like crazy to make himself understood. And the bargeman thought that Darwin was going to hit him. And Darwin remarks, this man was about, you know, a hundred pounds heavier than Charles Darwin was. He could have just taken Darwin by the throat and strangled him easily. But he thought that that was the kind of degradation that slavery brought. Namely, that this man was afraid that this puny white guy was going to slap him or hit him. And he cringed at that thought. So Darwin was a man who recognized face on the de deleterious effects of slavery. And he gives many other anecdotes about the difficulties of slavery. But he was a child of his time and he thought that some races were more advanced than others. This has no impact, I think, generally on his theory. And you have to be careful um, when reading Charles Darwin's accounts and not to, as you said, Mindy, not to dismiss the whole account on the basis of some mistaken apprehensions that he as a 19th century figure was liable to. Let me read you some other things from the chat. So um, Jay Carlson said, lots of previous theories have fit the data and work that we nowadays are false. Philosophers of science might say that evolution is empirically adequate. It fits the data we have. Whether it's correct, accurate, accurately describing the way the world works is a more robust metaphysical claim that scientists might be more hesitant to admit. And then Chris Shea follows up with, um, Darwin began his career training to be a surgeon and quickly abandoned the profession in horror. In his intellectual evolution, did he ever turn to think about evolutionary aspects of disease? And he wrote, this is a hot topic now since it's of COVID. No, I don't think he did. Um, he thought about conceptual evolution in a few passing remarks. He saw that his theory could be applied to the development of ideas over time. 
But as far as I know, he didn't have any, he didn't apply his theory to the development of disease. You know, he was a great disappointment to his father because he did go up to Edinburgh Medical School where his grandfather had gotten his medical degree, where his father had gotten his medical degree, where his older brother, also called Erasmus, got his medical degree. But Charles just couldn't hack it. Um, he writes in a letter to a friend to think about taking a course in Materia Medica at eight o'clock on a winter's morning in Edinburgh is something fearful to remember. And on one occasion when he watched a operation on a young girl who was having her leg uh, amputated because of gangrene, it was done of course without anesthetics and he couldn't take that, the pain that she expressed and he ran out of the operating theater so Darwin was not cut out to be a physician. And as far as I know, he never thought too seriously about medicine thereafter. Okay, so another question for you. Um, I'm curious about your suggestion that implementing method acting in historical work and how the historian is responsible for rendering the actions of historical figures comprehensible. Do you think that this suggestion could find purchase outside of the field of history? And have you thought about how a similar skill could be used by clinicians, for instance? Well, I think having sympathy for your actors in history or for your patients in the clinical, uh, in the clinic is important. Um, you have to see the world through their eyes. In history, it's a little more, well, I don't know if it's more difficult at all. In the case of Darwin, uh, he ha we have huge supplies of his letters, diaries, manuscripts. I know in my own case, um, Darwin ran across a problem uh, that I knew it was going to bother him. And I thought he must have worked on a solution to this problem. And I was pretty sure that he was the kind of individual who wouldn't let a problem like this uh, simply lay fallow. And after some diligent search, I did find a small manuscript in which he outlined the problem and proposed several solutions to the problem. So I think when you have a great deal of sympathy and compassion and understanding of your actor or patient, you'll be a lot better off. The patient and the actor are more than a set of symptoms uh, they are real people. And I think putting yourself in their place, I'll say as a historian, that helps me write the kinds of histories I write, but um, I'll let the opposite, I'll let the doctors in the audience confess to either being sympathetic to their patients as an aid to understanding their symptoms and them as individuals. That's a great and loaded question, but let me um, I, I, let me just give you another, instead of like answering that, let me give you another question. Um, one of our colleagues right? does the fittest information survive? We bemoan the fake news, but maybe it's survival tells us something about the information ecosystem. I think it does. It means that there's a ready, there's a ready receptive ecosystem for our fake information. If it, if, it were, if it fell on deaf ears and no one responded to it, uh, it would die a, a natural death. But I think uh, insofar as it gets a response and it works well in the kind of conceptual ecological system that exists on the internet, uh, then it's been naturally selected and it will produce offspring. That is absolutely true. Jay Carlson has his hand up. Oh, Jay, great. Go right ahead. Take it away. Yeah, yeah, sure. Thanks. Thanks for this talk. Um, full disclosure, I'm 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 also I'm I'm a philosopher and, a, and and someone who's preoccupied by epistemology and also by disagreement. And I'm thinking about your your sort of discussion that you mentioned with Michael Roos, um, where in a sense, like there's there is a sort of 
there is this sort of idea that what history is about, it's about sort of like getting us to the facts, whatever the facts are of that, you know, and that the job of the historian as a historian is to describe those facts as, as accurately as possible. Um, of course, the, the issue that you've sort of, that you sort of, that is sort of raised here is that, well, we can, we can, you know, the, the historian's job is also very reconstructive. It's very, you know, um, and very frankly, it has to be, it's selective, it has to be selective um, in what, how it sort of compiles the, its evidence to tell a certain, to tell a certain story. My question though is what, what are your, what are the, what are the criteria you think we should use to, 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 to adjudicate between these sort of, you know, these compelling, these two, these two, you know, uh, sort of warring, you know, conflicting stories. What's the sort of, what's the sort of criteria we use to say that one is a better account than the other? Great question. Well, first of all, yes, the historian must be sure of his or her facts in relationship to the individuals talked about. But not only about the facts, one has to construct an adequate explanation for events. How did Darwin come up with his theory, for example? Uh, that has been a preoccupation of historians of science for a long time now. Uh, and what are the criteria you ask for selecting among the facts and data to render an explanation acute? Well, I think you have to read everything the author wrote as best or as much of it as you possibly can so gathering, as it were, the data is important, but also making the argument is important as well. The data has to be understood, the facts have to be understood, and constructed such that they yield an explanation for the events of interest. How did Darwin, for example, come up with this uh, theory? Why did he delay in publishing on human beings? Uh, those kinds of questions. And it requires, I think, both uh, a sufficient amount of evidence on the one hand and intellectual dexterity on the other to construct the kind of explanatory framework that seems adequate. You might ask the same question of the, of the physicians uh, assembled here. How do they know that their diagnosis is adequate? When do they stop asking the patient about his or her symptoms and come to a conclusion about, well, I think I understand your problem now. I suspect you'd get a few different answers from the physicians uh, assembled. No doubt. Oh, get somebody else. Maz, you're open. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Hi, great. I'm really fascinated. I'm, I'm speaking to you and listening to you here from um, South Yorkshire in England over across the pond. And I, I'm a psychiatrist uh, and uh, I'm particularly interested in psychiatric phenomenology. Uh, I'm really interested to hear your view and take on the concept of delusional memory. Um, patients with typically with schizophrenia who are deemed to have delusional memory. Um, as far as we can ascertain uh, from the point of view of the patient, from his or her subjective worldview, there is absolutely no distinction between that particular so-called delusional memory um, and irrespective of whether, it, whether there's any objective evidence for it ha having ever occurred. So I'm really interested in, 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 in your perspective on that in the context of evolutionary biology and, the, and, and history in terms of how do we make history? And you've spoken a little bit about how does history assemble itself in our minds and how we articulate that. Well, let me just give you a little uh, vignette about Darwin and memory. Um, in defending his position, he said that he never employed the idea of theory in collecting facts. As a good empiricist, he simply collected facts wholesale. And only when he collected enough facts did he start working on a theory. Now he said that because that's what you're supposed to say as a good empiricist. If you follow the rules of Francis Bacon, 
uh, that's the way you would allow uh, your activities to spin out. But if you look at Darwin's notebooks, no phrase appears more frequently than according to my theory. That is, as he was collecting facts, he was also theorizing. And that kind of expression just escaped his memory when he was reflecting on his activity after he had published The Origin of Species. So even, I don't think Darwin was schizophrenic about this at all. Uh, he just had a lapse of memory and he knew what the right answer should be. The right answer as a good empiricist is you collect facts and don't speculate until you've got enough facts. But that's not what he did. And we know he didn't do it that way because we have his notebooks. What is the case with schizophrenics? I'll leave that to the psychiatrist in the audience. I will say though, and this is simply word association. One of, um, when da Darwin came back from his Beagle voyage, he was plagued by a number of symptoms. Um, he had digestive problems, he had heart palpitations, and it was a great mystery of what Darwin's disease was. Some thought it Chagas disease. Darwin was a great collector of bugs. He loved beetles. And the assumption was that he was bitten by a beetle carrying the parasite of Chagas disease. And um, he therefore suffered from it for most of his rest of his life. But um, in trying to understand Chagas disease, one historian of medicine suggested what it wasn't Chagas disease. It was a psychiatric problem that he had. Darwin um, disappointed his father and the writing of the origin of species was comparable to killing the old Adam and his real father. And he hesitated to plunge in the knife. And as a result of that, he suffered these kinds of symptoms of giddiness and heart palpitation. But that was the psychiatric view a more reliable view was it was an iatrogenic uh, production. Darwin took the waters frequently and probably the prescriptions offered him for his disease did not help. But about, psych about schizophrenia, I have no further judgment. Anybody else interested in asking a question or making a comment, or should we give Bob a little downtime till he meets with the fellows again, I think at 1.30? Cindy, I just have one comment. Jerry Kassir wrote a number of years ago, 1989 to be specific, you know, certainty is unattainable in medicine. And I think that's true in biology also. Uh, we have islands of knowledge and a great sea of unknown. As we get closer, as, as the island in, in, increases in size, so does the shore of ignorance. And I just wonder, that's, it seems to me that's a good way to look at this whole thing. And when we're talking with people who, who say, well, but the experts said such and such. Well, we're doing the best we could with the, inf we can with the information available. I just, you might want to comment on that. Thank you. Well, I think that is the account I would give of Darwin uh, in the 19th century. He had certain views. Those views were impregnated in many ways by the culture in which he existed. And he makes judgments on the basis of the evidence that he has. But it's not the full scope of evidence possible. And Darwin was not privy to the full scope of evidence possible. So. Uh, he himself would be the first, I think, to suggest that his views were quite limited and they were always improving. And the whole history of evolutionary biology is, a, I think, a testimony to a firm foundation and continued improvement through the, the several uh, decades after Darwin. So I think you're right. Thanks, Richie. I just want to say certainty is unattainable. 
There are islands of knowledge and a great sea of unknown. Well, I actually think that's a great, uh, great time to leave this. And I really appreciate Bob coming to speak to this group. And um, I know the fellows will meet with him in a little bit later, but the, um, but I just wanted also um, second mark is that next week we're going to have um, one of uh, Mark and my old friends and former U of C student who's now um, faculty at uh, Columbia, uh, Lydia Dugdale. And uh, she actually wrote a terrific book. She'll talk to you a little bit more about it this week. But we're going to finish 20, the, the 2021 year from this lecture series, continuing with one outstanding speaker after another. And thanks, Bob. I promise nobody else gave a lecture as interesting or provocative as you. This is definitely not the thing we hear every day. So we really appreciate your time and energy and happy holidays to everyone. Thank you.